it's the, but the, the, the baker gave it to me to say, this is my testimony. Mm. So then I said, oh, yeah, okay. So, some questions from you guys. We don't have too much time. David. You mentioned Adrian Rich, and I've written about her, and she was a big part of my personal academic. Yeah. I think she's that for a lot of people. Um, and I came, the poem Planetarian came to mind because it talks about science and poetry. I was wondering if you had any other thoughts about Rich and that. Do you still admire her? I do, yeah, I do. Um, and diving into the graph was my sort of mm -hmm. epiphany poem because I kind of felt like that's what I was doing, you know, kind of becoming a detective in my own life and trying to figure out, you know, the, the thing itself and not the story of the thing. Uh, going beyond the superficial. Yes. Hi. Um, first of all, thank you for coming out and um, speaking with us. And um, this is a little different um, topic, but I was I'm very curious to find out what you think about ecofeminism and spirituality. Oh, yeah. Um, so we talked a little bit about that. I think I have a vexed relationship with ecofeminism, but things that Heidi said to me last night at dinner make me think that maybe I'm misunderstanding a lot of the project of ecofeminism. But I'm definitely not an essentialist. But I mean, of course I'm a feminist. Um, but I, I sort of see that um, the constructivism of things. You know, I don't necessarily think that women are inherently more this or that. Um, I, I actually resent the idea that somehow because we're mothers, you know, we're, we're, we're more nurturing and we care for this or that. And, and that comes from realizing that, you know, I, I care just as deeply. Most of my adult life was not as a mother. I didn't become a mother until the brink of 40, and I'm only 54 now. So, most, you know, I had this long, happy, childless adult life where I cared just as much. Um, so for me, my transformation into really wanting to engage with the environmental crisis is not, parenting is not my entree into that. Um, and I think it's too glib and easy thing to say, right? Um, about women, um, and it makes it, I think, hard for women scientists to be kind of um, thought of like, like if you're a woman, a woman scientist dealing with the environmental crisis, then you're doing it somehow out of reasons of spirituality. So, but you, go ahead, say what you said to me last night. Well, I, I said I'm definitely not an essentialist, but I feel like it's more of what feminism adv is advocating, in my mind, is equality for everyone, right? So, uh, it's more compl compl complex than that. But So with ecofeminism, what I talked about was all biotic life coming to the table in a way in which there is no, none of this sort of dualism and power over. And that comes out of, in my mind, patriarchal capitalism, where there's, it's a system of somebody's always on top of someone else. So it could be a woman occupying that space, right? We're being a dominant figure. Um, and it's not always about gender. It could be racial, it could be religious, it could be you know, class, it could be a variety, it could be sexual, you know, sexual orientation. But there's, it's a system, uh, it's a dualistic system. And so ecofeminism is saying that is not working for us. And it's a system of hierarchies where humans have been sitting on top of nature or perceive themselves that way. That's not actually true. And so, um, Ecofeminism seeks to undo that. And it isn't about women being essentially closer or having some sort of spiritual experience that's deeper and closer to nature than men do. Or even that women are inherently better activists or more, you know, better set up to be pro-environment or anything like that. Um, and then also, within the environmental movement, it's, it's important that women get the same kind of recognition. Because sometimes they don't. I mean, some feminists have talked about historically within the environmental movement, they might not be treated with as much respect because we tend to fall into old fashioned gender roles. Um, but it, definitely not essential, essentializing it. That's not how I see the feminism at all. I mean, there are branches of it that do. I was going to get back to Was that what you meant by spirituality? Um, I just want to hear um, your opinions on it. And um, to go further, do you believe in a constructional? Constructionalism? Mm -hmm. Constructionalism. Um, um, theory. And do you think that women can take a, a, a male dominate, dominant kind of attitude and uh, kind of adapt to that instead of, you know, uh, a more feminine or feministic kind of view on environmentalism? I don't know. 
I mean, I, I know that right now I'm trying to play to win. And um, so I think um, any kind of theory that speaks out of a place of victimization isn't useful to me right now. Um, and um, I'm really interested in finding, I'm really interested in dismantling the oil and gas industry. That's my life's goal. And, um, I'm, and so to do that, I'm trying to find the choke points um, where it's really vulnerable. Because I think it's like a Goliath that can be actually be brought down with the right kind of slingshot, maybe different slingshots. I don't know the answer to those questions, but um, it, I, I, my feeling is that for right now, it doesn't help me do my job better to know the answer to that. Um, what I do think a lot about, because I, I work so hard and I'm off, often sleeping, like I pull a couple all-nighters every week, right, and I'm 54 and that's hard on my body and hard to do, and I've got young kids at home and so on. And so I have a, a lot of plates in the air. And so what I need <laughs> is a spiritual system that gives me the strength to carry on and gives me courage in, when, in times of great. So I don't, I, don't, I don't have time for paralyzing despair. So my spirituality actually um, comes out of Quakerism, um, which I discovered um, as an adult. I, would, I grew up in a very different sort of church, very fundamentalist Christian church, and I left all that behind long ago. Um, but Quakerism is faith in action, and so in my Quaker meeting house, um, which is an old meeting house that you know people who were abolitionists, people who fought slavery, people who fought for women's rights, people who fought against nuclear war, all these people who came before me sat in silence in the same place. And so for me to go into that place, I feel myself one ch like link in a long chain of people who risked far more than I did. I mean, the people who who helped slaves escape, if they were caught, they, you know, they could have been hanged. They could, they, they had, they, and they were parents too, with kids, and they were afraid. And so when I get sort of chased around by the gas industry, um, the kind of um, intimidation that I experience is still less than a lot of human rights workers, you know, who came before me. And so I feel, I like to feel in their company. Mm -hmm. And I like to imagine that, um, the divine is here and now, you know, in this kingdom, and this is what I, I'm interested in, is the, the humanity and the divinity of the things all around me. And so, but that comes from the other Quakerism, which is, which, I mean, has a lot of women in it, right? I mean, all the women suffragettes. Um, it's it's a very, very, thing, all it's very pro 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 feminist, right? So it has that in it. But, so, but that's a different sort of lineage of spirituality than I think a lot of the you know, real legal feminists kind of participate in is. It's like, uh, I think they have different origins, my sense of it. Time for, yes, one last question. What are the consequences that you're finding so far from, from the framing of uh, fossil fuel abolitionism? As I, I heard a talk of yours from Doc Hopkins and using that, that kind of strategic frame and intellectual frame. Uh, how, what's, what's the, what are the Well, this is a good segue into my formal remarks that I'll talk about, but I, I I think that there is a problem. Um, I think the problem is that there is a disconnect between the magnitude of the environmental crisis, which is huge, and what people can imagine doing about it, which is very small. And people correctly perceive that they could toil their whole life and make a lot of personal sacrifices and change their whole personal life, and it won't make a bit of difference. And they're absolutely correct in that. There's no point in us saying that every little bit helps, because in fact, it doesn't truthfully doesn't. And so if we want to scale up people's, um, we can't bring down the size of the crisis. And there's no point in minimizing how bad it is. So the only thing I can do is to convince people they have to do much bigger things. Um, and so for me, the way to do that is to use the abolitionist framework. Um, because in fact, there was a time in our nation's history where we were ruinously dependent on something that we were it was so ingrained in the whole system that it was going to be really disruptive to get rid of it. And, and, and there were people who said, we can't regulate this. We can't have the misery compromise. We can't you know, make laws regulating runaway slaves. We just need to abolish it. There's no way to turn an atrocity into something that's acceptable. And those people were scorned and hanged and all these things happened to them. 
So that's the spirit. Because we look at those people as heroes now. So I want people to see themselves as superheroes who are willing to do really large and big things. Because otherwise there's no hope. Quite frankly, is it? The, the only hope is going to lie in true heroism now. Because we've burned up all the time on, you know, with non-actions. Now it takes, it's going to take really big things. And so how can I per persuade people to do a really big thing? Mm -hmm. and, and the only way I know as a writer is to look back in history and say, well, in fact, there were some times where things were pretty bad and people did huge things. Mm -hmm. So I chose the title of my most recent book, Raising Elijah, to be named after the abolitionist Elijah Lovejoy. Mm -hmm. He seemed like the perfect kind of foil for me because he was also a father, right? He had, he, his wife was pregnant at the time of his assassination and he had a two-year-old son. So in all of his last letters, they were all about, to his mom, they were all about how he, he would do anything just to dismantle slavery, but the only thing that made the whole thing so sorrowful was his knowledge that if something happened to him, it was going to happen to his two-year-old and his unborn child. Because in those days, of course, as a widow, his wife was going to have a really hard time of it. But ultimately, he decided because he was a father, he had to take these steps because he saw other fathers who were slaves have their children actually sold away from them. And as a father, he knew the person with the bond between families and to, to realize that families were deliberately being sold apart to demoralize slaves, to keep them you know, um, so depressed that all they would just turn into machines and work. It was out of his identity as a father that he took really big actions, actions big enough that he was killed. But his martyrdom then sparked huge, I mean, it was hugely inspirational then. Um, his best friend was the president of Illinois College. Um, and then when, his, when Elijah Lovejoy was killed, his friend um, turned his own house into a station on the Underground Railroad. And his friend lived with his sister. And his sister then saw all this and all, saw all the runaway slaves coming through this house. His sister was Harriet Beecher Stowe. Mm -hmm. So she went on to write Uncle Tom's Cabin, which is absolutely transformational. So here you have this novel, this book, that did more than all the kind of speeches and tracts and treatises, right? So here's a way that creative writing really reached people all the way to Abraham Lincoln that changed the nature of the conversation. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think things like that can happen now. Um, but it's not going to happen if we're timid. You know, fortune favors the bold, as they say. And I think that's true. So I'm really interested in people like stopping being afraid and starting to just do huge things. So how can we get people to yeah. do that? Well, abolitionism is a kind of honorable but, thing. But we were talking in class about the differences. We, we have to stop in a minute. But between these kinds of movements and what kind of, of, of situation can inspire people to get up and march and protest and what can't. And I think the trouble with, you know, with, with women that were, were, as you mentioned, seeing slaves coming through, um, with women that were beatings and scandalous things. So it's a matter of what it, how can we make visible the damage that the, the gas fracking and the fossil fuel industry is actually doing to us. It seems a bigger challenge to get people to actually go up and march than some of these other movements. So I'm just really ask, asking, is it a bigger challenge? Because yeah, I don't different. think so. I mean, I, I mean I, this is off the top of my head, and I don't want to think more about the question, but I mean, we like to imagine that people living in um, the time of slavery must have seen these things all the time, but not necessarily. If they lived in the North, they, people didn't have internet, people didn't travel. When would they have seen slaves? They didn't, they didn't you know, we have more pictures of fracking. You can just Google them if you want pictures of harm. Um, you can see them, you know. They, so sometimes, somehow at other times, you know, it, it was, um, you know, people like Frederick Douglass and other um, people who had first-hand experience with slavery who went around from whistle stop to whistle stop and talked talk to people. Um, well, it puzzles me why we're not. I mean, maybe the question. Well, I think it's always it always more. puzzles people at the time why you know it puzzled people in Germany why how did yeah, Hitler get so far right. before you know he no, was turned the other way everybody had like they had no idea that you know all this was happening all around them and so 
the, the ability of people to to believe comfortable lies rather than unpleasant truths is probably been an option yeah. every yeah. every struggle, and, and it only looks clear to us in hindsight. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, I think I think there were more people during Martin Luther King Jr.'s march to Birmingham, Alabama, who were just busy carrying on, redecorating their houses, and couldn't be bothered, and had no idea this was going on. It only looked like it captivated the whole nation, you know, in, in, in hindsight. hindsight. Oh, that's yeah, I'm, right. I'm pretty sure that's right. Very, very interesting. So we'll show the film clips then as part yes. of the next. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Very good. So thank you. Thank you.